All right. Well, I'm going to tell you the Cambridge Analytica story. As Justin mentioned, uh, this is an important story for the intersection of, of tech, media, and democracy. It was a, a catalyzing event. You could say there was an era before Cambridge Analytica and then one after. Uh, and I am very knowledgeable about this, so it's an area of my expertise. This presentation will be very dense with information, will be a mix of video clips, but also primary documents uh, from the investigation. Um, if you are familiar with this story, you will learn something. And if you have no idea what this story is about, uh, you will definitely get the basics. Um, so it starts with a grandfather of AI research. Indeed, Robert Mercer received the Lifetime Achievement Award in 2014 from the Association of Computational Linguistics. And he could be understood as uh, very important in the contribution of language models, particularly speech recognition, but other large language models. So we're dealing with somebody who um, is a very significant computer scientist and acquired a company from Britain called SCL Group, which stands for Strategic Communications Laboratories, uh, in order to develop a uh, political data practice uh, for his family's political interests and was a major donor behind the Ted Cruz campaign and then the Donald Trump campaign in 2016. A very private family. Uh, he says he's simply a computer programmer. But that's how this starts, a story of a computer programmer uh, essentially, uh, who got into politics and had huge impacts in shaping uh, election outcomes. Uh, and indeed, the fallout of the Cambridge Analytica scandal um, had an impact on the family, uh, which, of course, about out of the 2020 uh, election. But he's also mostly known uh, as a former co-CEO of the hedge fund Renaissance Technologies, which is considered the most successful high-speed algorithmic hedge fund and, of course, is um, involved in quantum computing and many other super high-end uses of co computational. So you've already been introduced to Cambridge Analytica through its spokesperson, the now infamous uh, Alexander Nix, and you get a basic idea of their pitch to campaigns and vendors more broadly, this uh, use of psychographic, psychological profiling. Uh, unsurprisingly, this conduct uh, spawned whistleblowers. And in fact, the first whistleblower was Christopher Wiley in 2018, who, here's a photo of him uh, giving testimony before Congress. The, um, the main idea here is that um, the data that was boasted of by Alexander Nix at the big data conference that you just saw was harvested deceptively from a Facebook quiz. We'll take a look at that soon. Uh, and Facebook found out about this, ordered them to delete the data. Alexander Nix told Facebook that he did delete the data, but he lied and the data was retained. And so this was the essence of the first whistleblower and after Christopher Wiley uh, started talking about Cambridge Analytica, another person who worked at the company came forth. Her name was Brittany Kaiser. Uh, she's also featured in the documentary, which we'll talk about soon. And her um, main um, wh wh whistleblowing revelation was focusing on how countries with strong data protection laws were protected from data abusers like her company, but countries that did not have strong data protection and privacy laws were targets of companies like Cambridge Analytica. And these whistleblowers actually spawned other whistleblowing around social media companies like Facebook. In fact, uh, Frances Haugen was a whistleblower who uh, she 
over many years, photographed uh, documents and then methodically leaked them uh, to reporters as the Facebook files. So we clearly are in the age of the whistleblower now, uh, moving from the 20 teens to the 2020s. And even more recently, Arturo Behar, another meta Facebook whistleblower, uh, decried how executives refused to take actions, even though they were presented with the data of harm. So we're going to um, learn a little bit more about the uh, first scandal. Uh, it was documented in this film, The Great Hack, on Netflix. Um, that's me on the cover. Um, and I am one of three subjects uh, in the film, which follows us on our journeys in and out of this scandal, The Great Hack. Um, you'll see what this refers to shortly. I'll show um, a portion of uh, this film uh, in particular. Um, this film was um, first screened at Sundance, and uh, that version was never shown again. It was substantially re-edited for Netflix. And so I'm going to show the opening sequence of the Sundance cut, um, which uh, was on only shown that one time. One day I was sitting with my app developer and realized, oh my god, I can see way more than I should be able to about everyone. It was a data gold rush. Every experience became designed to extract as much of our data as possible. So, uh, yeah, so that was the um, op opening sequence for the Sundance cut, the Netflix version, much shorter. A lot of details uh, that were described there were cut out to make it simpler to understand. But I definitely was given a technical <laughs> explanation. Uh, now we're going to see... Uh, Chris Wiley, the first whistleblower's explanation of what Cambridge Analytica really did and really was uh, his his testimony. Um, to, to note, he wasn't actually in the film, but this was public footage that was incorporated into the film. He didn't participate because he didn't want to because Brittany... So that's the voice of Carol Cadwallader, the Guardian reporter who broke the story uh, in the New York Times and the Guardian the spring of 2018. So in the spring of 2018, around this time, the headlines would be filled with stories of this scandal. I'm gonna talk a little bit about the visual effects, which are done by Ash Thorpe of All Creative. It was really important to have visual effects in this film that expressed such a difficult concept, such as data radiating and leaking uh, out from our activities invisibly, but also the notion of an algorithm as an object uh, which exists in some kind of concept of space, even if that space is not necessarily a, a normal 3D space. Uh, so you can see like the, the visual effects are really trying to get inside the machine and make it visible for a general aud audience. When the filmmakers first approached me, I said they couldn't make the film because it was just too difficult to make visually understandable. But uh, the opening sequence cost more than most documentaries cost in total. So I guess with talent and money, you can solve these kinds of problems. So now stepping back, um, what does what does this catalyzing moment what does it represent back in the spring of 2018 and indeed the aftermath of the election of 2016 there was a a, a concept of a new threat model one that was the over overlay between state actors campaign vendors and arbitrageurs the the marketplace of of middlemen who sell data and uh, and target audiences um and how the overlay between that, new concerns over information warfare, this mysterious company, Cambridge Analytica, which is involved in this epic Facebook scandal, and also the out the rolling out of the general data protection regulation. Indeed, it became into effect in May of 2018, so a mere two months after the Cambridge Analytica scandal broke and uh, ricocheted through headlines around the world. And so indeed, these issues were top of mind to many, many people all at once. There were many skeptics right away who decried 
the company's claims, there was no way that they could do what they were claiming with the psych psychographic psychological targeting and was just oversold and overhyped. Got this a lot. And I would argue that all of these people missed the point. And I will talk more about what the point really was now. Um, I filed a public lawsuit against the company because I wanted to find the truth. I really wanted to know, and I knew that the only way was through data. And I wasn't sure that those who were espousing the company's claims were looking at real data and the skeptics as well. I was wondering what the skeptics were looking at because there was no data to analyze. So we used the law to find the truth through data. And we had a hypothesis that this was a British company, that our data was in the UK, not in the US, and therefore UK law would apply. And we were right. Uh, indeed, my case is uh, documented in the Information Commissioner's Office reports of this period, as well as the House of Commons committees that investigated it. But more important than my story was the story of every American voter, which was told in these documents, but ignored by the press. Maybe because it's in this inscrutable British re regulatory legalese, but let me translate what's highlighted in the uh, yellow text. It basically says in incredible British un understatement that if Cambridge Analytica didn't go out of business, we could have gone after them for violating the privacy of UK law in the US elections. That basically US data is in the UK, our laws apply, and you broke our laws. And we could go after you, but you went out of business. And that's the only reason that we were not able to um, achieved justice for mass data abuse against the entire US electorate. So it's a really big deal, totally hidden away in this regulatory language. Uh, this is some documents that I got out of the lawsuit. Um, this is a document, which is a letter from the ICO, which is the regulator of data protection in the UK to the chief data officer of SCL Group, uh, the company that um, is the um, uh, that that Cambridge Analytica is part of, and they were disputing that I had rights to get my data because I wasn't a UK citizen. But of course, foreign nationals living overseas are able to exercise the right of access according to the law. That it doesn't matter where you are; it only matters where your data is. So here is the ICO schooling the chief data officer on the kind of most basic premise of the law, and even trolls Mr. Taylor a little bit here. Uh, if you go to gov.uk, like the main UK government website, it says there that foreign nationals can get their data. So it's hilarious that you think that you're exempt from this. But um, the trolling went both ways. Uh, we'll get to that later. But Ultimately, uh, it was a criminal offense to ignore the order to give me my data. And they were convicted of that criminal offense. And what we wanted was some basic information, such as uh, what personal data was used to determine various rankings and the purposes and um, who was disclosed it. So where did you get my data? What did you do with it? And who did you share it with? These are questions that the UK law entitles us answers to. And it's a criminal offense to not answer them if you're ordered to do so. And that's what happened. Um, but this company really told on themselves in their discussions with the ICO, they really did say that I had no more right to get my data than a member of the Taliban sitting in a cave in the remotest corner of Afghanistan and they told on themselves that way because they revealed that they make no distinction between terrorists and voters. They're all the same in their eyes. And indeed, this company boasted on its ability to transfer its military industrial complex practice to commercial and election work. That's their whole deal 
in fact. That's our, that was our hypothesis too. It's well about. So now I'm going to show you a recording from a committee hearing um, that they specifically talked to the Deputy Information Commissioner's Office about my case in UK Parliament. It's well about um, Professor David Carroll's case against Cambridge Analytica, which I know you'll be aware of. He, he's been unsuccessful in his, his appeal. I mean, do you, what grounds are there when, when someone has made a data request to a data holder? Um, that request would appear to be lawful, but that company's gone into administration. What, what, what should be the mechanism for retrieving data in a situation like that? Uh, yes, I, I mean, as, as far as it's possible, it depends on where that data has gone to and where it resides and how those, um, those residual assets of the, of the administration are dealt with. As data becomes more and more valuable, um, that is probably something the, the insolvency law is going to have to be looking at in terms of the other a assets of an organisation. Um, in respect of his individual case, we've obviously prosecuted the company success successfully and um, have, achieve have achieved a fine through the courts. Um, we continue to analyse the information that we hold from the company, um, one, of the, one of the purposes of which is, as far as is possible, if we are able to identify, if not his specific data, but at least be able to provide that, that piece which which the company wasn't able to provide with him, which is the narrative mm. as to how the data was used and how it moved through the sequence of algorithms within Cambridge Analytica. We hope to be able to produce that in due course. So relating to David Carroll's Well, data. maybe if we can do it at an individual le level, that would be great, but at least in terms of being able to describe the process in more detail in terms of how the data moved through the various stages. So you believe you'll be able to... We have people working at it. I wouldn't want to put words in their mouth as to how accurate they'll be. It's a complicated task. We've got large sets of data, some of which is combined US electoral data, but also some of the ocean data examples that others have given yeah. e evidence on. It's more likely we'll be able to tell the narrative rather than pinpoint an individual's journey through that process. But that's certainly something we haven't given up on yeah. and we continue to pursue. So we'll follow up on this later. Do take a note that they wanted to provide a narrative to the American voter on what happened to our data uh, because they did seize the servers under criminal warrant and they did look through terabytes of data and you did hear him mention U.S. electoral data and ocean data. That's the psycho psychological profiling data. So let's take a step back. What are we talking about here? What is the issue? Well, we're looking at the overlap between data rights and democracy itself. And we are looking at this question because we have discovered that there is a political technology industry that exists. Cambridge Analytica is an example of it. And we know that this industry is internationalized, that we would think naively that political technology companies would be domestic to their own com their own countries. Each country has their own shops, right? Because, you know, elections are a matter of one owns country's business, right? No, this is an internationalized business. We also know that it's militarized because this company in particular definitely comes from the military industrial complex. We'll look into that. And we know this not because of a conspiracy theory, or, but because it's global investigations are producing documents that are incontrovertible. Uh, here's a brochure from SCL Group bo boasting of its activities over the past 25 years in countries around the world. Perhaps you might see your own home country highlighted in red. Um, so this is not just a United States affair, um, but rather, um, a global affair, and the, the company uh, boasts of its work with the UK Ministry of Defense and US State Department. This is a feature. This is a uh, the, the fact that these are military grade methodologies and tools and communications tactics. That's that's why they're different. That's why they're uh, a unique offering. We're now going to look at some documents from the Robert Mueller investigation. Uh, this was um, the first big investigation uh, out of the Trump presidency uh, investigating 
um, ties to Russia, but uh, because it was involving the campaign, Cambridge Analytica was a subject. And so documents that uh, became available through Freedom of Information Act show just how detailed that investigation was. And a key thing to look at in some of these documents is the agreement that the Trump campaign and Cambridge Analytica have a reciprocity agreement. They just share all data for all use. And so this plants an important seed for us that uh, in the Republican data machine, all data is in one pot. Everyone shares the data quite promiscuously. Uh, and so it's all one day database. Uh, the other important thing to make a note of for later is that ethnicity uh, is a key part of the inventories as well as the psychographics and stuff. So back to the big question we're looking for, is there a simple fundamental right, the right to know, the right of access? And is this an enforceable right? Meaning can the regulators really get the truth out? And is it gonna be inclusive of inferences, inferred data, or is it just gonna be sort of so-called um, publicly available data? That This is really an, a, an investigation into the bounds of disclosure. How much can we force them to tell us. So we went to datarequests.cambridgeanalytica.org even before Trump was inaugurated in January of 2018, uh, uh, 2017, sorry. And I uh, immediately got this autoresponder, which proved the first two parts of our hypothesis, that Cambridge Analytica was a thin facade for a military contractor called SCL and that our data was in the UK. And we know this because you can see you have to pay 10 pounds uh, to SCL Elections Limited after you verify your identity, which I did. And I got this response on Cambridge Analytica letterhead saying that they would comply with the law. And some identifying particulars are not being disclosed to protect the identity of third parties, ha ha. But Julian Wheatland signed this. You already know this fellow. You saw him in the first video clip, one of the only executives who participated in the documentary, for and on behalf of Cambridge Analytica. There's, there is no Cambridge Analytica. It's just SCL. He's the chief operating officer. So the data included um, my voter registration information, uh, my participation uh, in elections and those outcomes, and then this chart of political topics ranked, and then some sort of predictions for partisanship. This is what they gave me. We, I, and I posted this to Twitter, and immediately people were like, this is illegal, you need a lawyer. And the reason it's illegal, because in the EU, and in the UK was the EU at the time, it's illegal to make political profiles of people without their knowledge or consent. But also under section seven, you can ask a lot of questions and get more data and explanations and disclosures around this. So that's really what the lawsuit was about. What does this mean? You have to tell us. In so in the lead up to the 2020 election, the Trump database leaked to the UK press, in, in particular channel four, and they did another investigation. And this is an excerpt from that. So this is now um, long after 2016, but in the lead up to 2020 in the United States, because the database leaked in its entirety to this journalist out outfit. In 16 key battleground states, the algorithm placed voters into one of eight categories. Most likely to turn out was the base, core Trump on his side, core Clinton on hers. Those least likely to vote were marked as deadbeats and then disengaged for both sides. In the middle were the voters who might go either way and were open to persuasion. But also crucial were these two segments. On his side, they were called GOTV, get out the vote, and on the other, deterrence, voters who might be encouraged not to vote. The campaign would then create ads that could be targeted at the people in these groups through Facebook and other platforms. Many were dark posts, which could appear on people's Facebook feeds and then vanish. Cambridge Analytica can help you run more cost-effective... This machine was built, in part, by a team from the now notorious company Cambridge Analytica, working hand-in-glove with a team from the Republican National Committee. What we found 
is that in those crucial swing states, black voters were disproportionately categorized for deterrence. In Georgia, they made up 32% of the population, but 61% of deterrence. In North Carolina, 22% of the population, but 46% of deterrence. And in Michigan, 15% of people, but 33% of deterrence. In total, more than 3.5 million black voters were marked for deterrence. If you include other ethnic minorities, they made up 54% of the deterrence segment. So I hope you remembered that ethnicity uh, slot in the database. Uh, well, that it was used uh, and effective because of it was disproportionately targeted. Um, in Brittany Kaiser's memoir, uh, she wrote a book called Targeted. At the end of the book, there's a graphic, uh, and it is the same graphic <laughs> uh, that was just described on Channel 4 of how they organized the electorate according to their algorithms. There's deterrence. So, this is so we're going to see now um, the anchor uh, went to... Uh, Milwaukee and went to a voter in the database who was marked for deterrence and talked to her about it. So this is what the file said about you. So that's you, isn't it, Annette Clinton? Yeah. Yes, that's me. That's your address? That's correct. Now it says you're a nurse's aide. That's correct. Orderly. It said your income at the time mm -hmm. in 2016 was between twenty five and thirty five thousand dollars. That's correct. That's correct. And that you were a renter. Yes, that's correct, too. So they had you down pretty well. So far? How do you feel about the idea that the Trump campaign categorized you and lots of other people as deterrents? I don't feel, I don't feel right by that at all because you shouldn't, they shouldn't have to categorize no one in order to get votes. Black people were disproportionately represented. There were many more black people on that list than there should have been proportionally. What do you think that tells you? That the black community is target. You know, it shouldn't be like that, that they would use you and categorize you to make it harder for you to vote. Does knowing this change anything about how you feel about the last election? It makes me want to go out and vote more, actually. Ah, so there's the crux of it that you can see your voter profile, then perhaps it neutralizes its power over you. And indeed, um, that's why we were just trying to see what our profiles looked like. So uh, Krishna Guru Murthy came to my house too, and hey, finally hello. gave me my data. Hey, I've come to give David Carroll a surprise. <laughs> this mild-mannered New York professor has spent four years fighting to get the data the notorious company Cambridge Analytica had on him. I became obsessed with finding answers. His story formed part of the hit documentary. <laughs> Carol won the legal rouse, but never got his full data after Cambridge Analytica refused and then went bust. But the file forms part of the Trump campaign database obtained by Channel 4 News. But he doesn't yet know what we've got. David, why did you want to get your data? To see if it was possible. Uh, to try and pry open the secret world of voter targeting. It's a mystery otherwise. What were you worried about? Worried about our data being abused, uh, used against us, uh, used to exploit the divisions and fractures in American society to divide and conquer. What kind of blowback did you get? Was uh, it stressful? It was stressful because Cambridge Analytica really did not want me to pursue this lawsuit. So what did you end up getting? I got some data, which was a very thin profile. It had my voter registration information, which is pu publicly accessible, but it had a model of my political beliefs, so issues ranked. And it certainly wasn't anything near what the company bragged that it had on, on us. What did you think when you saw Cambridge Analytica implode? You know, when the story started running, when the Channel 4 News expose, you know, was broadcast. We did all the search, all the data, all the analytics, all the targeting. 
that I, w that I wasn't going to get the answers to our questions. Where did they get it? What did they do with it? And who did they share it with? So you were trying to get the data that Cambridge Analytica held on you in 2016. We have obtained the Trump campaign database from wow. 2016. <laughs> that's, that's hard. I mean, that's, we've been, it's like, how else would we be able to see that? You can search it. And what we found is a file for David Carroll. Uh, it's more, more than this? Well, let's have a look. <sighs> um, so now you got a few sort of simple things about issues. What we have here is your openness, conscientiousness, mm -hmm. extroversion, agreeableness, and neuroticism yes, scores. A very low neuroticism score, thankfully. <laughs> <laughs> And your, their, their percentiles. See, this is critical. People who have very high conscientiousness and very high neuroticism scores, they would be very easily manipulated and have no idea it's happening. Okay, so that's just the personality info. So we go down to commercial information. It knows what kind of car I have. It knows if I'm a gamer. It knows my investments. It knows how I eat. Um, it knows if I use coupons. <laughs> It knows, you know, if I've ever written a blog, it knows, you know, how I use the internet, whether I use social media, whether I have a home office, or donations. All the charities that you support. Indeed, yep. This is what um, we were fighting to get. Uh, this is what I knew was there. <sighs> I mean, I think every voter has a right to see this. It's crazy that we don't have the right to see this. It's crazy that you have to come and show me mine. <laughs> That's the David Carroll file from the Trump campaign from 2016. Yeah, well, the, when you showed me my personality model, that shows that they had tried to calculate that. And... That's what psychographics are. That's that, that openness, conscientiousness, agreeableness, extroversion model, which is co very controversial whether or not it works. But... What matters to me more is that they said we didn't do that for the Trump campaign. Came John Aliska said that. Yes. Uh, and, for example, um, Matt Oskowski, who was, who's you know, currently working for the campaign, he said on the record, when asked by a reporter, um, sorry to disappoint you, but we didn't do psychographics for the Trump campaign. Well, why do I have one in my file, Matt? You know, it's just a level of abuse that we're tolerating in this country. And we can't. It works as a suppression system. It works to subvert the will of the people. So would you like the file? <laughs> it's, it's been a long time coming. After all this time, just to click it is all it took. <sighs> well, thank you. <laughs> Obviously, I'm pleased that it's gotten into your hands for this purpose, but... Ideally, we wouldn't have to rely on you to get these questions answered. Yeah. <laughs> so, indeed, I was an act of journalism, uh, not regulatory authority, which got me my data. And so now let's take a closer look at the file. You can see here uh, the insert date. Uh, the creation date is 2015. So this would line up with the creation of, for the cruise campaign during the primary season. Uh, there's that ethnic group identifier. Um, and in, indeed, there's uh, the psychographic score. We could talk about how this model was generated. And again, it's not important. Reading your own is like a horoscope. What's significant is the, that the people at the top of the percentiles would be identified, the 99th percentiles. But that's who I'm worried about, not every, everyone else. Uh, other things in the data can show sort of the structure reveals, you know, who it's for and, and what the purpose of the data is. I uh, definitely modeled my family accurately. So now let's look at some other documents. This is uh, final reports that came out of the Senate Intelligence Committee, a bipartisan committee that spent a whole volume looking at questions that related to the, the, the sort of issue of Cambridge Analytica and like companies. But they could not conclude because Alexander Nix did not cooperate. Um, and they didn't get access to the data 
because they could not get it from the UK authorities. So even one would naively think that the close allies of the United States and the United Kingdom would cooperate at a certain level, but they did not. There was no access. So we, the UK authorities had our election on the servers and our lawmakers couldn't look at it. Um, Rick Gates was a deputy campaign manager for the 2016 Trump campaign who was investigated by Robert Mueller and worked for Paul Manafort, who was, was pardoned by Trump. And Rick Gates had the same concern that I did, that Cambridge Analytica was a shady, dodgy operation that shouldn't be trusted and was concerned that U.S. voter data was going to the United Kingdom. So it's wild to realize that this guy who was investigated as a henchman was worried about the same things that I was and others. In The Great Hack, you see Brittany Kaiser go off to her Robert Mueller interview. And indeed, she described how the data privacy policies make us targets and countries with strong data pri privacy um, are protected from bad guys like her. Remember when we saw the video of the subcommittee, um, the deputy information commissioner reporting to the MP about my case? Well, they never issued a final report or anything, just a sad letter. Um, and in that letter, it we can see more forensic proof that the leaked database is the Cambridge Analytica database. And that is because the other data brokers that supply the data are detectable in the data files. So for example, the companies Labels and Lists, Infogroup, Aristotle, Magellan, Axiom and Experian, very well-known political data brokers, in my files that Channel 4 gave me, you can see their names in the file. So AR stands for Aristotle, IG stands for Infogroup, LL, Labels and Lists, et cetera. And then you can see those companies in Alexander Nix's uh, big presentation at the Big Data Summit. So the very companies that they publicly bragged about, the companies that we demanded to get the access to, that we knew was, was there, they refused to give us, it eventually leaked and we saw what we knew was there. And indeed this company had very poor data security practices and was in the process of offshoring to a place where it would no longer be scrutinized. So the mistake of exporting U.S. voter data to the U.K. was their first mistake because that allowed us to get it. If they had kept it in the United States, we would have had no rights. But of course, they're short, surely moved to places where there are no good protections or accountability because that's where they can operate best in the shadows rather than bragging about it at conferences. Uh, let's look at another uh, end, end, uh, end, end state uh, report. This from the Federal Elections Commission, also investigated Cambridge Analytica, came to the same conclusion as the Senate. Uh, the ICO wouldn't give us anything. We, we, we know you have all the information. They just, we, you, we, they, we couldn't look at it. Really frustrating. Really, really frustrating. Uh, the FTC did end up suing Cambridge Analytica, the CEO and the app developer. Um, and indeed, Nix was banned by the insolvency services for being a director for seven years. Now, that term is coming up soon. So the question is, what new company is he going to start? Kogan is uh, definitely still working in the data har harvesting business. Uh, back in 2020, Steve Bannon was ordered to appear before probes, but uh, he didn't cooperate and was uh, prosecuted and convicted of that, and that's out on appeal. But even just this week, uh, President Trump, former prior President Trump, needs money badly, uh, and so apparently is talking to the Mercers again to support his uh, current campaign. So the Mercers are back, folks. 
Hilariously, um, the Mercers make crazy companies that are fun to follow. So Rebecca Mercer, who really was the main force behind Cambridge Analytica, the daughter of Robert Mer Mercer, um, she created a company recently called Dynamo Recoveries that is suing Alexander Nix for destroying Cambridge Analytica. So they're trying to recover their Cambridge Analytica investment, and they're blaming Nix for ruining their company. Amazing. Truly amazing. This is how the rich this is how the, the rich work, folks. They make companies to sue each other. Ah, so to step back, what what are we worried about? Well, indeed, ever since the invention of the computer and its application in the electoral process, we've been moving faster and faster towards a notion of an algorithmic democracy because the electorate itself becomes more and more addressable and sortable and Data is available and blendable and combinable and sold on the free market. Uh, and we don't have access to it. We don't have control over it, even though it's ours. It's us. It's our vote. It's supposedly the sacred privacy of what goes on in the voting booth. The other thing that the Cambridge Analytica really highlights for everyone with crystal clarity is that advertisers get all the privacy and we get none. That the privacy asymmetry is the problem that we deserve some access to recalibrate this asymmetry, that the privacy is power. And until we resolve that, this is the problem. So by creating access to data, we get some of the uh, fairness out of the unfair arrangement. Uh, since Cambridge Analytica, though, there's been some regulatory activity in the United States, but not a lot. Five states passed data rights laws, California, Virginia, Colorado, Utah, and Connecticut. They're all different, <laughs> all of varying strengths. Um, and uh, there was an opportunity uh, when Democrats controlled uh, Washington to pass the American Data Privacy and Protection Act, but Democrats blocked it. So the best chance we probably had to have a National Privacy Act came and went um, unfortunately, uh, and that would have been uh, a different context that we would be talking about things like TikTok, for example, today, uh, because of um, the problem of not addressing this when we should have. So we still do not have um, a national privacy law, even though many other countries passed national privacy laws after Cambridge Analytica, the United States did not, only five states. So the key takeaways from this talk are as followed. If it was a, a lot to absorb, and especially if you've never heard of this company before, but even if you had, it was a lot to absorb. But let me just give you the key things to take away here. So the first one is that Cambridge Analytica was not just a Facebook privacy scandal. That's what it's usually summarized as. But I would argue it was a stress test of the international data protection regime, which failed. So it was a big test and we have not learned from the failure of that test, really. The second big thing is that there was a big debate over Cambridge Analytica's special sauce, whether it worked or not. But I fear that that really distracted folks from evaluating the efficacy of its racist deterrence campaign to demobilize Black voters. That apparently worked quite well. We also learned that the Republican voter data machine is promiscuously blended among sources and shared across campaigns. This is very different from the Democratic Party's voter machine, which is opposite. Uh, and it leaks, like leaks like crazy. It's almost publicly available if you know where to look. Insane. And the last key takeaway is even though all this happened, Americans still do not enjoy the fundamental right to access their own voter profile, and nothing prevents other Cambridge Analytica-like companies to continue to abusively collect and exploit voter data, especially if they keep it in the United States and don't make the mistake of exporting it to a data-protecting state. Like, that's what happened. That's the story. So I'm really interested in um, your responses and your reactions. Thank you. Thank you, David. Um, and I think uh, uh, we're just basically going to open it up for questions now. Um, one of the things that's uh, kind of uh, nutty for me to just recognize, which I said in the chat already, is just how um, you know a lot of this this activity uh, 
took place, you know, started, I suppose, about a decade ago. Um, so it's been almost a full decade since, uh, you know, many, much of uh, what David's referring to actually happened. Um, and here we are in another election cycle where uh, we've seen some jurisdictions, for instance, in the European Union uh, and other jurisdictions like the UK, and et cetera, which have introduced uh, legal uh, changes and reforms that have essentially outlawed some of the types of activities that we've uh, heard discussed tonight. Um, but in the U.S., very little has changed uh, since 2016. So I just want to open it up um, to any questions that, uh, from the floor, um, things that you are uh, interested in or concerned about or would like to ask David about. So feel free to uh, throw your hand up, uh, come off mute. Um, I don't see a lot of cameras on right now, um, but if you want to come off camera, uh, come on camera and ask your question, you're welcome to. Um, we got a question from Max. Uh, in what ways will the 2024 election be different compared to 2016? I think that's a, a U.S. question, David. Yeah. Um, well, I, I can answer it first through the uh, technical platform lens. Um, in 2016, Facebook was a dominant singular social media platform. I wouldn't say that it is anymore. Similarly, Twitter was a authoritative and singular powerful social media platform. I don't think that is anymore either. So the two most significant social media platforms in 2016 are different fundamentally than they were than they are today. Even more detailed, um, platforms now publish political advertising through their public databases, Facebook's and Google's ad transparency. And Max, I know your group is working with those. Those didn't exist in 2016, that indeed the outcry of Cambridge Analytica forced the companies to make those databases so that so-called dark posts could be assessed that political advertising could be reviewed by civil society. In 2016, you could not do that. You could not look at the way that the voters were targeted for deterrence. Those ads disappeared. So today, you could not mount a racist deterrence campaign on the commercial platforms because those ads would be reviewable the way they were not in 2016. They disappeared into the ether. So those would be sort of big technical differences. The social platforms that matter today are not Facebook and Twitter. And um, the ads platforms at least have some transparency that didn't exist then. Okay. Uh, um, and, uh, you know, I think... Um, uh, I guess important to 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 just say as well that that uh, even though we have those transparency libraries and the rest of it, um, civil society groups all were finding examples of ads that uh, have made it through despite the fact that they probably ought not have. Um, so I know some of you are looking at uh, ad ad libraries even in your final projects. Um, they're very very interesting uh, uh, there. Bryn asks. Oh, sorry, David. Go ahead. Yeah, I was going to respond to Bryn uh, bringing Canada in. Um, there are so many rabbit holes in the Cambridge Analytica story. I could do a whole class on this one company and, um, there's a whole Canada class <laughs> because, uh, there was a, a company, uh, that did the programming for Cambridge Analytica called aggregate IQ that was based in British Columbia. Um, Christopher Wally himself was a C C Canadian, um, and was affiliated with Aggregate IQ, uh, the company that built the web application for uh, these campaigns. So, um, but Canada had its own um, Cambridge Analytica SCL investigation and had its own committee uh, subpoena and do really important um, public hearings. So similar to the UK House of Commons, uh, the House of Commons in Ottawa also produced important witnessed testimony to the scandal and was involved in opening it up and the international co co cooperation therein responding 
uh, and MPs in Canada were very instrumental in co co cooperating with others. Um, and then Canada more broadly has, you know, had its own um, internal discussions about whether PEPEDA, its national pri privacy laws, adequate, and and so on. So, I uh, I would recommend C Canadians to uh, look look into their parliamentary record to see all the stuff around SEL and Cambridge Analytica. There's quite a lot, um, and I could point out the MPs uh, who are in, involved there. And the same is true for many other countries that they had their own investigations and your own politicians, whether it be Singapore or India, Trinidad and Tobago, the list goes on and on. Um, they, there's a lot in the public record. Um, you know, mi millions of lawyer hours were spent on this scandal across the world. Um, I, I'll just underscore that. It's actually... Um, probably impossible to estimate not only the number of lawyer hours, but also the number of um, government hearings that took place across the world um, as a result of the Cambridge Analytica scandal. Um, and I, I, I think without the Cambridge Analytica scandal, you would not have the Digital Services Act. Um, you would not have many of the online safety acts. Um, it was a real catalyzing event. Um, and you know, no matter what you make of the details of it, uh, frankly, you know, you could argue with David, I'm sure, about uh, some aspects of it for the uh, remainder of the evening. Um, it, it was a watershed moment that uh, uh, changed changed uh, the, the trajectory of tech policy in the world. Um, Dr. Fry. Yeah, thanks. So, David, can you talk a little bit more about how Channel 4 got access to that data? I, I I couldn't really understand like how it is he the the uh, the anchors seem to indicate that it was quite easy for him to get it. Well, he mentions that at least in the document. So how did they get it when you weren't able to? What was that process like? Yeah, great question. Um, it was frustrating because the database was leaking um, multiple places. It potentially leaked. Um, and then it was leaked deliberately to channel four and they, in, in its entirety, and then they made this story, uh, and they cooperated with some local outlets like the, um, the Miami Herald did a, a, a piece on the Florida day, day, data, et cetera. So it's a kind of combination of the fact that the, there was such poor data security practices and this, so it was leaky from the from the get go, uh, and then the ICO seized the servers, and they and then the civil servants did their own forensic analysis, um, and they were not able to succeed from what we could tell, um, and obviously did not share any of their findings. So the fact that it leaked to the public, you know, I I just I surmise that the leaker was frustrated that the ICO did not do what they said they were going to do and force the issue. Um, but I think that by choosing Channel Four, it really limited the audience in the U.S. to a British audience. Uh, so you know, it, it didn't really make an impact where it could have if it was, if it had been given to a different, um, a, a different media, if it had been given to a, a, that was a key part in, in 2018 when the New York Times and the Guardian co-published and cooperated and, and broke the story so that it was both a, a UK and a US news story and then and, and global from there. This latter one seemed to be a, a, a UK news story for UK audiences. Oh, those wacky Americans and their crazy yep. Cambridge Analytica. It never really broke through to us. Yeah. Thanks. Yep. I, I know you said that the personality data that you saw was perhaps a bit trivial and horoscope like, but I'm curious if you did look, looking at that data, if you did feel like some things were scarily accurate or if it just seemed like completely 
out of nowhere. So I have lots of thoughts about, you know, the accuracy of these profiles. Um, like I said, they're not useful individually. They're useful in aggregate. They're useful in finding clusters, outliers, uh, not really characterizing whole sets of people. Um, but that said, um, the accuracy of these scores is probably significantly variable based on how the data was collected, that there was um, um, probably 30 million people who took that personality quiz. So they probably have the most accurate scores. And because they took the quiz directly, the rest of the electorate is modeled from that 30 million. So, you know, that 30 million sample is then was created to create my uh, scores. So my scores didn't come from a quiz. They came from the derived model. So how accurate is this model in giving everyone a score based on 30 million sample? What I, we don't know. And then even then, what is it good for? Um, there's some evidence that came out of Cambridge Analytica's own documents that psychographically targeted emails had a much higher open rate, much higher, like a, a level that would make a marketer blush. Um, so when you're dealing with marketing funnel conversion rates that don't sound that <laughs> interesting, that's kind of what we're looking at here. So there's some indication that they can work for certain tasks, but do they change votes? I don't think that's what um, people were claiming. Um, it's a tool in a larger set of, of various tactics and strategies. Uh, yeah, just to underscore that, I mean, a lot of, so a lot of folks who are kind of like um, skeptical, as David mentioned of the, the Cambridge Analytica story, um, it, you know, it's, it's for that reason, it's, uh, they're skeptical that, that, you know, um, this type of data could change someone's vote or, or what have you. Um, but that, that's sort of like, uh, really doesn't, I, I think, capture what this is about at all. Um, so I, I tend to agree with David's sense that, um, it's a misunderstanding of what's going on here. Um, yeah, and, and it's a, it's, it's a simplistic, um, reduction of the problem to say like does this change a vote as opposed to much more complicated questions like um were people deterred from participating um and how was that deterrence deployed um and what does that say about people's ability to be mobilized and demobilized out of the democratic in and out of the democratic process, not knowing that they are being mobilized and demobilized deliberately. Uh, that, that, that simple veil could be pierced to prevent it from happening. Um, and these deterrence campaigns, you know, they're, they're, they're not denied. They're, they're, the, the Republican mm -hmm. party doesn't deny that they do this. Uh, that just to, to, to many, it seems like it's, fair game um it's free speech it's it's how elections work uh, mm -hmm. you can motivate people to vote and you can motivate people to not vote it's it's just how you do this how how things are done so um that that would be um one difficult thing to re reconcile with with the the over overarching question we probably have time for one last question for uh for the night's out Can I just make a comment? Just yes, based, please. Based based on this whole conversation, I'm just you know I'm my mind is blown, and I'm so happy to know a lot more about this. But just what you've been talking about, David, and the fact that it seems like we all are becoming much more aware of data and the fact that we are datafied and our data are collected and harvested. And I'm just wondering if the more we understand about that, the more we start to think of ourselves as categorized by our data. And if that changes something about who we are fundamentally and changes you know, the way that we understand whether or not we can be ruled, if it makes us more vulnerable as categorizable people, because we keep being referred to that way. I, know, I have to mull that one over, but it just seems 
quite clear to me this is where we're headed. Yes, um, it is. It's not enjoyable looking at your data profile because it both like reduces you to these numbers and um, flattens you out. We want to be messier. It makes us too neat and clean in a way. Um, yeah. But also, you know, emphasizes the what what we look like in aggregate that our individuality is smothered over um, for various pur purposes. So it, it's not a comfortable thing to look at. And it can be frustrating too, because you want it to be so revelatory and it really isn't. Um, but at the same time, it does show a key to a larger machine. Um, so it's something, you know, um, because of Cambridge Analytica and the GDPR and other uh, laws in the States, it's getting easier and easier to request your data from more and more companies and organizations so it just takes more and more people doing it to see what you get and i think there are millions of untold stories hidden in data requests hmm. indeed uh the the swiss belgian researcher who encouraged me to do this paul olivier de hay um has done really important work with uber drivers and other kind of crowd work gig economy companies by using these laws to uh, get the companies to reveal how workers are exploited on these pl platforms. And so um, there are many different kinds of folks that could benefit from engaging in the data requests uh, that are available in different situations, not just for democracy, but uh, for labor issues and many other things. David, thank you. I think everybody, uh, we can all give a virtual round of applause and or uh, the, you know, incredibly unsatisfying little uh, uh, Zoom responses and things that uh, you're given the affordance to provide. Um, thank you. <laughs> but thank you very much. Um, next week, I'm going to kind of round, I guess, things out slightly with uh, some talk about policy um, and maybe the trajectory of things since 2016. Um, where we've got to both in this country and abroad, um, you know, kind of the state of play. Um, so that'll that'll kind of sum up some of the conversations we've been having, um, certainly at NYU and Cornell Tech around uh, things like the Digital Services Act. Uh, but we'll also, uh, uh, I'm sure, you know, address some of the uh, issues that were discussed tonight, um, as well as uh, in prior prior weeks. Um, so thanks, everyone. And um, uh, Catherine, David, anything to tell your students before we wander off? I yeah. will be uh, me meeting with my students uh, in t t 10 minutes. So we'll see you there. Thanks, all. Yep. See, see, see my guys at 845. And thank you so much, David. It was fantastic. Thanks. Thanks a lot. In my youth students, I'll see you Thursday. Justin Halford, uh, Cornell Tech, uh, you know, hey, uh, big hero being here uh, on spring break. Um, everyone have a good night and uh, we'll uh, see you later on. Bye.